Hello and welcome to our session, 21st Century Supply Chain Finance, Reinventing the Wheel or Back to the Drawing Board. We'll just wait a couple couple of seconds whilst everyone is, is joining the room. I see we've got a, a busy room here. Okay, great. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. My name is Dipesh Patel, editor at Trade Finance Global and, and host of the podcast Trade Finance Talks. And thank you very much to the fantastic team at BAF for an excellent few days at the BAF Virtual Global Annual Meeting. And, and congratulations on your 100th anniversary as well. So today's session, we're talking about reinventing the wheel or back to the drawing board of, of, of supply chain finance. And now, obviously, as we know, payables or supply chain finance is a set of financing techniques that plays quite a critical role in enabling global trade. And it supports the success of both international and domestic supply chains. And the economic value of these activities, commercial activities, lies in the trillions each year. But there have been recent market events around the very big public implosion of a high-flying boutique finance firm. This could have the potential to irreversibly damage this really important set of financing techniques. But at its core, supply chain finance has the potential to strengthen supply chains and to help drive financing to MSMEs, particularly in developing and emerging markets. So today we're exploring the evolution of supply chain finance techniques from many different perspectives, highlighting its core principles. And I'm delighted to be joined by Stacey Factor, Senior Vice President of Trade Products at BAFT, Christian Haushair, Chairman of the Global Supply Chain Finance Forum, um, and the European Supply Chain Finance Product Head at Deutsche Bank, and John Monaghan, Global Head of Working Capital Advisory at City Treasury and Trade Solutions at Citibank. Welcome all, and thank you very much for joining. So, Stacey, to, let, let's take a bit of a, a step back, and uh, can you explain what the benefits of supply chain finance is for, for corporates? Absolutely. So, from my perspective, the benefits are numerous for buyers and sellers alike. Um, it offers the buyers the ability to extend their day's payables outstanding without the adverse effect on the seller's day sales outstanding. So offering a win-win situation for both. So conquering DPO and DSO. It allows a much more predictable product availability for the buyer to avoid any disruptions in its supply chain activities and allows sellers, SMEs alike, uh, early payment through a new source of financing without using its facilities uh, through its local lending banks, without the need to post collateral um, and the advance many times at a better rate than it can do so um, in its local borrowing jurisdiction. Thanks, Stacey. And, and John, just from the other perspective, what are the benefits of supply chain financing techniques for banks? Uh, thank you, Depeche. As Stacy mentioned, there's a lot of benefits from a corporate side, but what about the benefits on the bank side? Uh, certainly with uh, banks like Citibank, uh, transactional banking, uh, providing uh, payment solutions, liquidity solutions, and financing solutions to, to corporate clients is one of the most important parts of our business. Getting back to on um, the supply chain finance side and, and looking at over the years, how it's moved from traditional letters of credit financing the supply chain now to more of an open account. What it allows us to do is service our clients and, and their supply chains, be it customers and or their vendors or suppliers, without actually having the, the customer relationship on either side of uh, our corporate clients. So again, facilitating uh, our ability to finance our, our target clients and their, and their supply chains. The other aspect in terms of why it's important from a bank perspective is the asset class itself. Uh, trade finance has generally been defined as uh, uh, short-term self-liquidating. Um, so it has its advantages uh, when we're looking at it from an asset class point of view on the financing side. 
And more recently, when we look at the, the various cycles, the economic cycles, uh, good and bad, more recent, uh, the pandemic disruption of last year, we find also from an asset class point of view, uh, the resiliency of supply chain finance assets, the various techniques that are used are actually uh, very, uh, very resilient uh, in terms of uh, uh, defaults and, and more importantly, the ability to recover in the event of a default. So you know, asset class, important, and the ability for us as a bank to offer up end-to-end uh, -end solutions in the supply chain with respect to liquidity, payment management, and supply chain finance uh, lends itself very well to, to working with our clients on, on movement of money and, and financing. Thanks very much, John. So resilient asset class and, and actually something that's probably quite beneficial to, to corporates. But I guess there, there, there's a piece around some of the techniques and definitions of supply chain finance. Christian, can you define some of the key supply chain finance techniques and also just go through how they differ? And I think we'll, we'll talk about a few of them. So corporate payment undertaking, payables finance and receivables discounting. Yes, um, so happy happy to do so. Um, so you already mentioned three key techniques, Deepesh, and indeed these techniques have been very much in the limelight over the uh, past years, particularly payable finance and uh, and also the uh, what you what you just referred to as corporate payment undertaking. Um, let me generally answer this question from a global supply chain finance perspective. The, the Global Supply Chain Finance Forum um, differentiates between two large categories of supply chain finance techniques. One is the uh, receivables purchase category, and the other one is the loan-based category. In this receivable purchase category, you will find techniques like payable finance and receivable discounting, the two techniques you just mentioned. Um, but this is not all. There is actually also factoring and forfeiting, and we shouldn't underestimate um, the role of factoring. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty big market, um, and, and currently the, the public focus is not so much on factoring, that we shouldn't ignore this business. It's very important and it's big. Um, however, of the dynamics and the, and the market size uh, we are currently looking at, the market growth is particularly on payable finance. And of course, uh, there is also a lot of interest on the other technique you mentioned, which is the corporate payment undertaking. This is a different technique, uh, which is a bit, uh, which is very, very similar to payable finance. Um, at first glance, uh, but, but there are some slight but very important differences. Um, one is that with the corporate payment undertaking, um, there is no receivables purchase. And that is actually the reason why it's not part of the receivables purchase category, but part of another category we are currently working on. So um, in summary, um, yes, these are the key techniques where you currently have the focus of the public on, but there's a lot more. In fact, um, there's also a loan-based category um, with very, very traditional financing techniques like uh, loan, loans against receivables or pre-shipment or distributed finance or inventory finance. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think that perhaps that potentially drives some confusion within, within the industry. And we'll talk about the Global Supply Chain Finance Forum a little bit later. But, but Stacey, I think there's definitely a need to, to really get those definitions right and also bring the industry together in terms of partnership. Do you think there's a need for industry cooperation or, or, or some of these standard definitions when it comes to supply chain finance? And why is that so? When a handful of industry players came together in early 2014 uh, to discuss the development of this important product and its exponential growth for the trade business, it was clear that each organization had adopted its own name for the various suite of products. And at that time, it, the decision was taken to develop standard definitions. Why? Uh, a group of subject matter experts from banks, associations, et cetera, came together to produce a glossary. The growing industry needed baseline nomenclature to allow not only industry insiders 
to discuss it, but also to facilitate discussions with regulators and investors. The need for a standard terminology was clear, and to this day, SEF stakeholders use these definitions in relevant industry dialogue. We were even able to use these when we uh, began our conversations with the financial accounting standards boards. So all in all, the objective is to standardize and harmonize the supply chain finance market terminology to make it usable in daily practice by banks and non-banks for global adoption over time. Thanks, Stacey. And, and Christian, I guess as the chair of the Global Supply Chain Finance Forum, what, why was it formed in, in your opinion? And also I'd like to ask, what, what has the Global Supply Chain Finance Forum been doing recently? Yeah, happy to elaborate on that. Um, so the uh, Stacey already elaborated on, on the history of the Global Supply Chain Finance Forum. Um, in fact, in 2014, it wasn't called Global Supply Chain Finance Forum. What we did um, in 2014 is we, we sat together in a very small room in London at JP Morgan and, and discussed what can be done. And then there was a decision, um, yeah, we need, to, we need to work on these definitions. And I had, I can only say I had the honor of, of, of being part of this whole exercise from the very beginning. Um, and the journey we have done since then uh, well, is, is indeed quite impressive. So what happened was that we set up a project with a couple of people and um, created these definitions that were published in 2016. Um, in a in a hundred page document uh, which is available and uh, I have it here in my hand and uh, this these hundred pages this document was actually the basis for what we today call the global supply chain finance forum we had a very uh, important time in 2016 when we said okay what do we do now once the terminology is published um, at this point in time it's just a paper. And if we leave it there, it will be a document which will potentially be buried in the desks of practitioners, but potentially may also be forgotten. So we considered what can be done and, and then came to the conclusion, we need to go public. We need to be more um, vocal on this and we need to promote um, our efforts because they are so valuable. So what we did at that time was we said, well, if you want to be taken seriously um, nowadays, you need a web page. So we created a web page um, and that went live in 2017. And then the next step um, over all these um, years was that we wanted to um, expand our, our, our group. And ultimately in 2018, we decided let's go public, um, let's enhance our, our group. And that was um, when we had our first inaugural meeting as a global supply chain finance forum. I took over as a chair at that time. And then we had an immediate agenda um, of uh, tasks we were working on. Um, let me quickly highlight salient tasks uh, we have completed uh, since then. We have published guidances on receivers discounting and payables finance. Um, we have been working on a document on uh, rules, ICC rules for supply chain finance. Um, we have, of course, always been um, very engaged in, in market issues, whether it be with regard to the accounting discussion, um, which came up over the past years, or the whole uh, discussion around extension and payment, extension of payment terms, the attention from, uh, from government on supply chain finance. Um, so we, we were involved in all these discussions. We gave guidance to, to regulators um, to the accounting bodies, as, as Stacy said, um, we have um, also given guidance to the uh, European Commission. They came out with a uh, with a pretty big report last year, and uh, the GSCFF was was also heavily involved there. So, um, by and large, we are we are very involved in what is going on in the industry. We of course promote our our standards. Um, because we deem them as helpful for the industry, not only for the industry, but also for any stakeholder who's, who has an interest in supply chain finance, whether it be an, an investor or a client, a rating agency, an accountant, 
or a regulator. Thank you very much, Christian. And, and, and I guess talking of bodies and working groups and, and other committees, Stacey, obviously I've heard of the, the, the BAFT Global Trade Industry Council. What, what about this in respect to supply chain finance? The BAFT and its Global Trade Industry Council had the foresight to organize a group of supply chain finance specialist experts in the field to develop how a strong framework for the payables finance program would work. So we're focused very much on the payables finance technique um, that would address the various global challenges that have been raised and certain examples of product abuses. BAF felt it necessary to undertake a specific initiative to outline the detailed structure, the roles and responsibilities of each of the stakeholders, the related documentation, and the practical application of the SEF payables finance product. The ZTIC felt such a document now called BAF's payables finance principles would provide the industry players, corporate buyers and suppliers, regulators, standard setting bodies, government agencies, accounting firms, and rating agencies, all of those that Christian has already named, with a stronger, more complete understanding of how the product is meant to work for it to be beneficial to buyers and to sellers. The GTEC recognizes and acknowledges that there are many supply chain finance product market structures and practices, but we reaffirm that those structures should not be called payables finance. Thanks, Stacey. And, and I guess, you know, tr tremendous work there and, and moving it to present day. Why do bodies such as, you know, FASB and IF IFRS have an interest in payables and supplier finance? And, and also what's BAF's GTIC done with them? Uh, since the development of the products um, way back in 2003, four industry players have been self-regulating themselves according to a speech that was given by an SEC member at that time. There have been no explicit wording financial standards for accounting for the product um, that would have shown up on the books of the corporate users, buyers. So in 2018, the big four accounting firms asked the FASB to review the technique called payables finance, also known as reverse factoring, to opine on the balance sheet and financial statement requirements for the product. Similarly, the IFRS was approached by one of the rating companies with a similar request, kicking off a fulsome product review at each of the US and EU financial standards bodies. Each of the FASB and the IFRS have access to accounting firms, consulting firms, investors, and corporates, but appreciated the assistance of BAFT in joining them in conversations with BAFT members and the key SCF players at the global trade banks. I should mention that each of the FASB and the IFRS are in final stages of reviewing what the disclosure requirements should look like for corporates using these programs. In order to provide transparency, which is really an essential issue around the product, minimize liquidity challenges and offer as much information as available for the investor community. Thanks very much, Stacey. Um, John, I guess a, a bit more of a direct question. Does supply chain finance have a bad reputation? Um, I think the nomenclature supply chain finance has come under some discussion recently with uh, market participants and perhaps high profile uh, bankruptcies on the corporate side. But as Christian said, it's important to note what is supply chain finance and that umbrella definition uh, encompasses a, a variety of different techniques, whether it's on the receivable side or, or the payable side. So to some extent, payables finance has taken a, what are we doing with this particular product from 
all, all participants. And, and, and as a result, uh, our job as practitioners is to get out the message in terms of what is payables finance and the benefits uh, to, to corporates, both buyers and suppliers, as well as funders. Uh, so I think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of working with the industry participants in terms of identifying what is payables finance versus some of these other techniques. So that's, that's a tall order. Uh, getting an understanding of uh, what payable finance is versus a receivable finance type program structures, the documentation, uh, the benefits, why is one using it, uh, all needs to be uh, communicated. And, and from a corporate perspective, we, we also adhere to you know, transparency in terms of identifying uh, what programs, particularly payables finance versus other types of programs. So the more transparency within the industry in terms of what is a particular program that's being used to finance uh, the various participants in a supply chain uh, uh, realm is, is beneficial to everyone. So how does one go about identifying and, and not being seen to your early question of is supply chain finance, does it have a bad reputation? I would say there are some components that perhaps have given us uh, uh, a taint, but payables finance on, on surface and, and as practiced by the, the definitions that BAFT and others and, and Christian has worked on in the definition books, I think is a very uh, pertinent product and it, it actually fits the needs uh, of uh, uh, various constituents in, in the supply chain and, and will continue uh, for the foreseeable future as well. There's definitely a need for it. Uh, um, so, yeah, that's that's my summary. So long dated future receivables don't count then. <laughs> and, I, anyway, I would, I would, I would I, there's no definition like on that one in payable finance, but <laughs> that's a good point. And again, it goes back to definitions and what are the right structures and, and how does it bleed into supply chain finance or payables finance? Thank you. I would maybe like to, to add to, um, to John's point um, that, yes, there was recently a lot of talk about supply chain finance. Um, there, there are certain market events we are all aware of, and, but I would not per se agree with the fact that supply chain finance has a bad reputation. There is always a risk of bad reputation, and, and this is exactly our task from an industry um, perspective, that we educate the market. I believe that um, most of the observers who seriously observe what's going on in the supply chain finance industry have understood the, uh, the benefits of supply chain finance. I like the comparison of supply chain finance as a tool. It's a, it's a very useful tool and you can create a lot of benefit for it. Like any other tool, it can be misused. You, if you have a hammer, you can build a house with it. But you can also smash a window with it. <laughs> Supply chain finance is not different from that. We have published rules and recommendations. And if you follow these rules and recommendations, you're on the safe path on the bank side as well as on the corporate side. And what, what, what also needs to be seen is um, there are always outliers. Uh, there have been outliers in the past. What is not seen is the vast majority of the business, which is going very well, and the vast benefit supply chain finance, whether it be payables finance, receivables, discounting, factoring, or other financing techniques, the vast benefit that is created to buyers and sellers out there in this world. Our mission is to, to close the infamous financing gap, and supply chain finance is an ideal tool to accomplish that task. So it's actually supply chain finance in itself shouldn't have a bad reputation, it should have a good reputation. Thanks, thanks very much, Christian. And 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 I think it's kudos to the industry for for continuing to innovate and, and create these products that that serve the, the, the market 
challenges when it comes to SME access to finance, the trade finance gap, etc. So let's actually talk about the evolution of supply chain finance. And Christian, do you think supply chain finance should evolve and develop to align with corporate goals? So perhaps things like the BPU or DD, etc. Absolutely, and I, I have alluded to that to that earlier uh, in, in the discussion. Um, what the global supply chain finance currently is doing is, um, I mentioned there will be a third category, we call it advanced payable. Uh, this uh, third category will entail three financing techniques. One is the bank payment undertaking, one is dynamic discounting, and one is the corporate payment undertaking. Um, this is indeed aligned against the needs of the industry, whether it be clients or, uh, or banks. Um, when you look at the uh, corporate payment undertaking, um, it is indeed a very smart technique. Um, you, you save a lot of effort. For example, when it comes to onboarding of, of sellers, yeah? you, you can easily finance or onboard hundreds of sellers without too much uh, KYC effort. However, um, there are also certain limitations. You do not purchase a receivable. That is why it's a separate category. And uh, when you look at the, on the accounting side, um, I'm not an accountant, but according to my experience, the, the question whether a receivable is purchased or not is a key um, criteria for the question whether the payable in the book of the corporate is regarded as a trade payable or as a bank debt. Um, from a supply chain finance perspective, we, we cannot ignore the fact that there is a demand for other techniques. Um, and that is the reason, um, and the trigger in fact was the, uh, the discussion on the, on the corporate payment undertaking. Um, so we cannot ignore that demand and, and that is why we came up with this additional um, technique description. The other techniques are similarly important. Dynamic discounting, for example, is also a very smart technique. We haven't reflected it in the initial version of the, uh, of the uh, standard definitions because we thought, well, it's, it's not funded business. It's just something between the buyer and the seller where potentially a service provider calculates a discount price and then the buyer just pays earlier. However, um, over the past years, dynamic discounting uh, has become more relevant. We also see corporations between banks and, and, and fintechs who offer dynamic discounting. Dynamic discounting is less regulated um, and it absolutely makes sense to, uh, to come up with, with smart offerings to corporates who maybe even want to use both depending on their working capital needs. Lastly, the bank payment undertaking addresses um, networks like, for example, the uh, we, we heard a, a report earlier on, 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 on the trade information network. Um, and this goes into this whole space like dynamic discounting, deep tier financing, um, where you have a bank payment undertaking and it can be financed by someone else because you have already adopted the bank and you know this is going to be financed. So it's a great opportunity also to, to support another um, seller or buyer with with with, uh, with, liquid, with with liquidity. So, um, in summary, uh, yes, definitely, we we need to take the we need to take into account the goals of the of the corporates. We need to take into account the dynamics which are happening in the market, and that is the reason why we are also developing the uh, standard framework of the Global Supply Chain Finance Forum. In terms of timing, um, where are we? Uh, we have recently published the. Uh, technique description of the bank of the corporate payment undertaking. Um, we have finalized our first draft for the, or our actually our finalized draft for the uh, dynamic discounting. This is currently under review. And we are just initiating the work on the bank payment undertaking. I expect that the bank payment undertaking should be available maybe end of the year or beginning of next year. And once that is done, we will take a general look at the whole main document the uh, standard definitions, and then update this document with a new category that's a bit more work, more on the editorial side, um, but it's important and ultimately there will be a second uh, edition of the standard definitions, which will take into account all these techniques, all the three categories, and uh, will have a much more comprehensive view on the market. 
Thanks, Christian. John, do you have anything to add? Are there other types of supply chain finance? Do you think that should be developed perhaps in the pre-shipment or PA finance space? So look, a lot of work is being done on, on pre-shipment PO finance. Christian mentioned the trade information network, uh, corporate payment undertaking. How do you make it easy uh, for the participants to, to get the financing they need? Uh, in areas of risk, risk management, there are discussions when you look at deep tier finance, can an anchor client help support the lending decisions uh, of a financier in, in making it palatable to expand uh, the financing needs to meet the trade finance needs across the, uh, the supply chain. Uh, a lot of work is being done, uh, the technology being uh, put forth over the last couple of years with respect to blockchain, with respect to what's being done on the trade information network, allows for easier, perhaps, uh, abilities to get comfortable with the, the underwriting and or the financing. So when looking at it, I think over the next couple of years, whether artificial intelligence, the blockchain to reduce fraud, uh, to perhaps give better insight into the, into the lending uh, decision process, all, all bodes well for, for supply chain. So though we've talked about payables finance with a, with a buyer backed uh, uh, proposition from a asset class, I've mentioned it's very, it's very liquid and many, many participants are comfortable with it. Getting into some of the other areas on the financing side, uh, more understanding of where the risk lies and, and what's, uh, what's the recovery methodology. Um, but I think you know, pre-shipment finance, uh, deep tier finance, all terms being used. A lot of technology vendors are looking at it, uh, looking at it with respect to how blockchain can help uh, facilitate some of these discussions. Uh, a variety of fintechs are out there, none of which have gotten critical mass uh, to help uh, grow these, uh, these new products or not necessarily new, but perhaps enhanced products. And I think we'll see that uh, in the coming years uh, as more of these start to take off. Thanks, John. And I guess that builds on, on the previous uh, room on, on blockchain for, for trade and supply chain finance. So I know a lot of the participants can, can, can watch that video. Let's talk about one, I guess, the other big theme of, of, of this conference, which is sustainability and, and ESG. And John, in your opinion, can supply chain finance help corporates and banks align to their ESG strategies? And can supply chain finance be used as a tool to drive ESG? So my, my opinion is absolutely. And we have seen it with our corporate clients uh, asking for uh, perhaps how can their own supply chains, if you think about it on the payable finance side, a large corporate very much focused on sustainability or ESG aspects, not only on the environment, but how to properly address their vendors in terms of doing the right thing from a social perspective as well. So we are seeing an adjunct in terms of using their supply chain finance programs to, to help support uh, their own initiatives in, in terms of whether it's environmental or uh, on the social side. Uh, so we will see a lot more engagement uh, in terms of developing that financing technique uh, for, for environmental, the betterment uh, for vendors to be managed better uh, in that respect. So. We've seen a lot of uh, uh, corporates announce supply chain finance uh, ESG initiatives. We'll continue to see that. Uh, I think it's the right thing to do and, and uh, a lot of benefits on, on that side. And it's complementary in terms of what, uh, at least on the, uh, the payable finance side and, and more will be done in terms of longer term with uh, taking that asset class and getting enough volume and then being able to perhaps distribute those uh, ESG friendly assets in addition to the better, in terms of the, the quality of that asset and tag on an ESG element to it, it actually would hopefully broaden the ability to, uh, to expand the financing throughout the uh, finance chain, uh, the supply chain. Thanks very much, John. I think we have time for a couple of questions. So if any participants have any questions, please uh, please put them through in the, in the chat. And actually, I'm going to ask a, a fairly provocative question from, uh, looks like our good friend, David Gustin. Um, and, and, and over to you guys for who wants to answer it. Is there any large company that rolled out payable finance programs without extending terms? 
I do so I, so. I can answer. We all have to answer that question, but yeah. you all jump in. Go ahead, John. You will answer. <laughs> hey, the answer is yes. So one of the propositions, and, and it goes back to the accounting side, um, how do you help your supply chain? So we've talked about ESG potential uh, opportunities, but the other aspect is to give uh, liquidity to suppliers that are in need of it at perhaps a, a lower cost than they can find elsewhere. So though it is beneficial perhaps to extend terms, there's also a benefit, particularly with supply chain disruptions uh, to ensure the stability of the supply chain. So we've seen corporates uh, announce that they're going to provide uh, supply chain finance initiatives without raising and or extending terms. So that that is a certainly a benefit uh, that we've seen in the market, particularly over the last year. I'm going to jump in and just add one point. Sorry, John. I, I think it's important to note, I would say, uh, have we seen it done without term extension? I think we see it done with respect to what are the industry standard terms for a specific product. Some organizations, some corporates are um, providing longer tenors and some shorter. So I think there's been an evening out based on what the standards are, the standards for the products themselves. So I, you know, I, that would be my thought. I know Christian, if you have something to yeah. add. Okay, let, let me let me also share some considerations here. So first of all, um, the uh, when when you look at the 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 question of extension of payment terms, um, this is a very isolated view. Uh, you have to see the full picture. Um, even if a payment term is extended, it may still be beneficial for the seller, this extended payment term, because the financing conditions will be so attractive as compared to a standard receivable purchase or, or factoring deal, that it's, it's still fine. So. In the end of the day, a payable finance uh, setup, if it's, if it's set up um, appropriately, it's a win-win deal for both parties, for the buyer and the seller. The buyer may pay a little later, the seller will still get their funds early, but they will pay less um, than with the old payment terms, even if that was shorter. That, that is one argument I would, I would like to bring here. The other point is um, that you also need to take into account the motivation why a buyer is introducing a payable finance program. They may not at all be interested in optimizing their working capital. They may simply be interested in uh, stabilizing their supply chain. They may have strategic sellers who they just want to support because their products are so important to the buyer that they cannot afford the supplier going out of business. So they want to support them with their, uh, with their capital string. And in that case, there is absolutely no reason to extend a payment term. They are just helping their seller um, with their rating and that's it. So I would say, yes, uh, if, if you go out there, you will definitely find such programs. Um, it will be difficult to, to name names due to banking secrecy, um, but um, I, I'd be pretty sure that you will find such programs out there. Thanks, Christian. Um, um, many, many benefits there. I guess in terms of in the wake of the recent market events, how are bankers adapting as they consider working with non-bank supply chain finance providers and fintechs? John, can I pass this question over to you? Look, there's a lot of opportunities to work with fintechs uh, in the supply chain or supply chain finance. So looking at the propositions, what's the offering, uh, what technology, what techniques do they bring uh, uh, to the equation to support uh, clients. Um, so I, I see uh, the, the world is evolving. Uh, many fintechs are out there with um, unique solutions that coupled with uh, the bank's uh, ability to finance the flows actually uh, brings forth a better proposition to, to our corporate clients. So uh, there's a variety of different, uh, different folks out there. And uh, we, look at, uh, we look at all of them and, and to see how how they can help support our clients and, and the, with, a, with an overall better value proposition. Many of the, um, the corporates are in great need of support for the onboarding of, of the suppliers, which can be a challenge, as we heard earlier today. Sometimes there are thousands, sometimes there are hundreds. So I, I believe strongly that the fintechs 
many of whom have um, come up with very specific onboarding techniques that are very helpful to, um, to a bank that's doing a uh, supply chain finance program. Yeah, and just to add to that, Stacy, with that in mind on the onboarding process, the new techniques, whether it's corporate payment undertaking and or providing dynamic discounting or some combinations of the above, that also um, it's, uh, it's beneficial to expand the, uh, the liquidity access to SMEs and others, um, but also looking at it from the, the accounting side and, and how, it, uh, how one should look at it from either accounting or on the risk side as well. So those are some of the things that as the markets evolve with fintechs, uh, we look at to make sure that uh, you know, addressing one need is not compromising uh, potential uh, concerns on, on the other side of the equation as well. Thank you very much, John, Christian, Stacey. I think that's about all we have time for, but a really, a really great session um, from, from you all. So thank you and thanks very much to BAFT for hosting a fantastic conference. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.